Well, what I'd love to talk about, I mean, um, the future of cities. How do you see the forces that will shape the city of the future? But if architecture is about improving the quality of life, then surely this is right at the heart of, of architecture. But how do we effect that revolution, that transformation? Could I kind of launch straight in? Alejandro. Hello. Hi there. How are you? Well, look, thank you so much for doing I'm this. I'm so happy, happy with this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Can I uh, kind of launch straight in and kind of introduce you, as it were? Um, I mean, you established practice nearly 30 years ago as an architect. Um, you're a Pritzker Prize winner. You were the director of the Venice Biennale. Um, you taught at Harvard. And I think it must have been 20 years ago that you created a, a partnership called Elemental. Uh, which unusually, perhaps uniquely, is a partnership between a university, an oil company, uh, and yourself with the objectives of infrastructure and affordable housing. Could you tell us how it works? It sounds a very unusual combination. It, it's still unusual for me. And, uh, and I would say that... Uh, the the reason why it started that way is is because I had a, an engineer uh, as a partner at the very beginning. So his way of looking at issues was completely different from that of an architect. When I arrived to teach at Harvard, um, I met this guy Andres Jacobelli. He was uh, is a transport engineer doing his masters at the Kennedy School of Government, and uh, to make a long story short, he said. Why don't we do something with social housing? And in my architect's mind, do something meant uh, a book, a seminar, uh, an exhibition, and in my wildest dreams, a prototype, a one-to-one -one scale uh, prototype of, of housing. In his engineer mind, he had to go into the market and prove the market wrong, following exactly the same rules as everybody else. And that meant at least 100 units, uh, with the same budget, um, in case you had a point and you want to make it uh, replicable, then you have to follow exactly the same constraints as everybody else. Um, so with that in mind of, of um, going into the reality with the same constraints, we understood pretty soon that nobody was paying for thinking better about the question. Uh, so. Uh, Brains more than bricks was in a way what was missing and and looking for money who, for who could at the beginning we were using our our uh, university academic salary to pay our, our ourselves in a way to sub, sub subsidize uh, but if you want to make it sustainable uh, we had to uh, go for a different scheme. And that's why, for, first of all, to make it sustainable means that you can't live on charity. This, has to, this was about professional quality and quality has to be paid. Um, fair enough. Of course, nobody uh, would like to make out of this uh, uh, a, a wealth or, or nothing similar like that. <clears throat> and then uh, to this company, particularly the universities was more or less in the DNA, but to this company, they understood pretty soon uh, that as part of contribution to the society, there were many ways and not necessarily in their own field. And um, so they gave a seed capital in the end. They could have, uh, this could have been a kind of angel capital, whatever kind of thing for a startup. At the time, the, the name startup didn't exist. Uh, and of course, their, their condition was, okay, here you have uh, some money to start working, but then you have to find your own way and actually, it was very good because uh, one of the conditions was professional freedom and uh, and intellectual independence. We will not <clears throat> follow any other agenda that what a, a given project uh, deserves. A anything else 
It, it's, and, and that's part of our freedom, I guess. And that was very uh, clean from the very beginning. And that's how it started in a way. And the role of the of the oil company in this in this venture. Now, well, it, it's two things. As I said, it was man, so double click on the on the story a little bit, not too much, but just a little bit. When trying to multiply the first project we did in the north of Chile, following the housing policy, and that policy meant seven thousand five hundred dollars for a housing unit with which you had to buy the land, provide the sanitation and build the house. And the conventional distribution of that money was one third each, one third for, for land, one third for sanitation, one third for housing. So you had to build the house with $2,500. But, but worse than that is that you had to buy land with $2,500 per family. That meant close to zero. And zero is in the peripheries underserved peripheries where all the problems have been accumulating, not just in Latin America, but in the world. So in order to think better about that, we came with a, with a different design solution. So we wanted to go from one example to seven examples. You know, Chile is 5,000 kilometer long. It, it goes from Moscow to Mumbai. So we had the opportunity to test different solutions for different contexts, from cultural contexts, uh, climatic context, uh, geographical context. And uh, in order to make that uh, effort of proving the market wrong in different situations, we applied for a grant. And the uh, uh, innovation grants are not in architecture. I mean, I mean, if you go through the uh, architecture schools, your grants, when, when it goes really well, it's $50,000. Uh, and we needed $1 million to make this seven housing complexes. Uh, so we went for a, an engineering innovation fund and it was mainly about technology and we wanted to produce uh, seismically isolated solutions. Uh, so we partnered with the School of Engineering. That's why, again, my engineering partner at the beginning was crucial. And for that, there is money, let's say, to, to technologically innovate. So we had to disguise architecture as a technological innovation in order to <clears throat> apply to bigger grants. After two years, we ran out of money. We were already working with families uh, for more than a year. We had to work for free. We couldn't abandon the families. And in this kind of desperation, we were looking for somebody to uh, invest in thinking better about our cities. So that's why I guess that it not, it's not necessarily your own field, but I guess that companies, and that was faster than going to the state, were interested in improving the overall quality of life and, and definitely housing in a relatively small country like Chile, 100,000 subsidies a year are given away. So if you make a mistake, you multiply it by many, but if you eventually improve that, then you can contribute uh, in a way, in a more significant way, uh, to the overall um, living together uh, of, of people in cities. The, coming to cities, um, a huge slice of humanity is deprived in terms of slums or informal settlements, however you turn them. Uh, in other words, 14% uh, don't have access to clean water, modern sanitation, electricity, uh, adequate shelter in, in one form or another. Your focus has been on on that part of humanity. That's correct, isn't it? Yes, yes. And, uh, and entering that question, actually right here in the bag, you see there's a, something that looks like some equation, not because I think I'm a scientist, but I think it's, it's better to explain the terms that you need to address uh, and then verify if you did better or not. It's just for, for clarity purposes. Uh, and, but I enter this kind of question as a designer, not as a, let's say, humanitarian aid or as a politician, even though you have to learn these different languages of economics, of politics, of, of, of social movements and uh, of the environment. But in the end, what we do is translate all those forces into form. So the question is, what informs that form? Uh, and here you go into these uh, big forces at play. And um, the, the 
the thing is that never before in the history of humanity we've seen this movement towards cities that even if counterintuitive, it's great news. I mean, cities are, are incredibly powerful to produce wealth, but also efficient to distribute quality of life through public policies. Uh, the problem is that we're, we're uh, being threatened by what we call the three S menace, scale, speed, and scarcity to answer the question of, of that equation. Uh, and it's expressed as such. We have to respond and accommodate 1 million people per week moving to cities with $10,000 per family in average. That's, that's more or less the money that, and this process of migration towards cities happens in the poorest countries in the world. That's, that's why the amount of money is around that per family. If we don't solve this equation, uh, it's not that people will stop coming to cities. They will come anyhow, but they will live in awful conditions. And I, I guess that <clears throat> that type of challenge uh, is the one that one would like to be close. I mean, if you believe you have some knowledge, uh, then I, here we do have a challenge, a professional challenge. That's why I was saying that it's about professional quality, not professional charity. And um, the way around this, of course, is not just design. Uh, design is just the way to synthesize a very complex question. And the more complex the question, the more need for synthesis. At the very core of architecture, there's a very powerful tool, which is the project. The design, um, without reducing the initial complexity of the project, picks up, identifies priorities, and organizes it in a proposal key, uh, in a non-linear non way. Uh, and I guess it was important that architecture uh, could contribute to this non-architectural question with the tools that we have at the very core of our practice. <clears throat> I've read about your half a good house uh, project. Um, and I've seen like so many of us and been inspired by uh, projects like that. Um, how has the follow through worked on that? In other words, as a, could you explain uh, just briefly the investment in the basic infrastructure of a house, uh, leaving open the potential to uh, to presumably expand that in the future? I'm I'm so happy about this question because it gives me the opportunity to explain once again uh, the starting point of this uh, because media has taking this idea of, of giving away half of a good house instead of a small one. And it may lead, and actually we have had some criticism, uh, how is it possible that you're de delivering half houses? Uh, well, it's, it's not the right way to frame the starting point. And, and actually, it, in, here in the back, up, up here, uh, Evidence shows that a middle class family, and this applies from Scandinavia to uh, to Latin America and developing countries, lives reasonably well in, let's say, 80 square meters, more or less, 80, 90 square meters. All of us, ourselves, live reasonably well in 80 square meters. So if, if you have money, be it public money or family savings, that's fine. Then you can build what is required and desired. But what if you don't have money? Again, evidence shows that in a uh, context of scarcity, in the best of the cases, public funds can pay for around 40 square meters. That's a fact. You can't afford more than 40, or you could, let's say the case of Chile, for example, uh, let's, be, let's build 80 square meter houses. Then you have to serve half of the families per year. We need to build 90,000 units per year to reduce the deficit in Chile. We are delivering at the moment 60,000. So every year, informal settlements grow by 30,000 families. If you want to make houses bigger, then that number will drop even farther, and increasing the level of informality. And there we do have a problem when once a family goes into informality. So. In the best of the cases, being able to deliver only 40 square meters, the only thing we did was 
why don't we look at, at those 40 square meters that are a fact, not as a small house, which is what the market does. I mean, for, for even for marketing reasons, you will see the little class uh, house-shaped form and then reduce to half of its size and cutely decorate it. And normally architects are called to uh, decorate that tiny shed. As, as Richard Rogers once said, it's, to, it's like putting lipstick on a gorilla. And normally design is seen as this kind of decoration of or good taste applied to hard facts. And we thought design is about framing the question differently. And that's why we looked at those same 40 square meters that I will underline again are a fact. You can't deliver more, not as a small house, but as half of that good, good 80 square meter middle class house. And those are the same 40 square meters, but the moment you frame it as half of that good one, the key question is, which half do you do? Not having enough resources. And we identified five design conditions to belong, and this is the definition of a public policy, to the half of the house that families will not be able to do on their own. On the other hand, and this is important to understand, and it's different from the developed uh, world, housing policies tend to be property oriented in developing countries. That means that the biggest transfer of public money into a family asset is through the housing subsidy. Families become owners of their households at the end uh, of the process. All of us, when buying a house, expect it to grow its value over time. It's almost the definition of an investment. That doesn't happen in social housing. It's closer to buy cars than buying houses. So we identified a set of design conditions that can, can allow a family to expect the, that family asset to grow its value over time. And if that happens, it's not just a shelter against the environment, it's an eco economical tool to overcome poverty. With that value increase of your household, then you can go into the different economical systems and pay for a better education, start a small business. You, you, have, you have possibilities in the end. And, uh, so the test we did with the first project was, okay, can we deal with this strategy of allocating better the resources um, and focus on what's more critical for, for the family and at the same time, what guarantees a value gain? And the proof is, and I received this video not long ago done by a photographer that actually was sent by an English magazine to, to make a, a service on, on the first project we did. I guess that to prove that it was crap after 15 years or whatever. The beauty of the thing is that this video that we were sent by a, a, one of the owners uh, said that his household worth now 10 times more. So he, he didn't want to sell his house, but he wanted to. He has been offered $70,000, uh, seven zero instead of 7,000. That was the cost of the beginning. Actually, the voucher, of the policy is 7,500, out of which $7,200 is state subsidy, family savings is $300. So that family transformed $300 in $70,000. Uh, and of course, if you look at the thing, uh, it, and this is, the, 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 I guess, the, what's more uh, complicated for, our, for us architects with the, the aesthetical expectation of society uh, that I was uh, referring to at the beginning. Our, our improvements are just relative, not absolute. It's relative to having done nothing or what was the alternative? If you compare to the alternative, then you understand the value. It's not that you show a picture and it looks fantastic. That is a more conventional way to test architecture. So I always ask wh whoever the uh, people that go to that first project that in in addition to putting the camera in top of the, the project, they turn the camera around and show the neighborhood. That neighborhood, in principle, is middle class family. It's four blocks away from the beach. It's in this, I mean, actually, it's so expensive that the land there at the beginning cost three times more than what social housing could afford. Yet you look at that city, if you put a picture, and it looks like a slum. 
So our our standards for middle class uh, doesn't look that great yet. The economical value of that part of the city, um, the fact that you don't have to travel one hour to work or to study or to go to a healthcare, there's a value that's invisible to pictures, and I guess that's the kind of thing that we have a challenge uh, to communicate. I, I mean, listening to you, I think you would share the proposition that uh, that the way forward is to transform informal settlements from within rather than bulldozing and relocating often with dire social consequences because the relocation is away from infrastructure is the way from uh, the source of income w would you agree with that I just want to clarify, we didn't talk in advance. I mean, w w this conversation is, is being spontaneously happening. And for some reason, what you've just said is in here. I mean, I made this kind of sketches uh, beforehand, just in case it could, they were useful. Uh, and j they just happened to be the thread of how to address this issue. And you're absolutely right. Uh, the thing is, how do we look at informal settlements and slump, at, at self-construction, not as the problem, but as the solution. To understand the, the, the and this is maybe, maybe something that we learned after reconstructing a, a city, uh, after the 20, 2010 uh, earthquake and tsunami in Chile. We had a, an 8.8 .8 Richter scale earthquake that destroyed 300,000 units. And uh, so, when trying to rebuild cities that are resilient against tsunamis, you understand that you can't fight nature. I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense to try to resist the force of nature. In that case, our approach was, let's dissipate the energy in the best of the cases, but understand that these forces are much bigger than yourself. With informal settlements, it's something like that. It's a force that is so much bigger that if we frame it properly, it could be part of the solution, not part of the problem. Actually, uh, right here, somewhere here, uh, there's an, a, re a reverse or an inversion of the classical concept of, of development. And this is an idea by Joan Clos, a former mayor of Barcelona. And he was the executive uh, director of UN Habitat 3 uh, that took place in 2016 in Quito. He said that his his attempt to was to convince mayors that cities are not the a consequence but the cause of development. It's not that first you become rich and once you become rich then you build good cities. His point was if we build good cities we can trigger development. We just have to follow this triad over here. Rule of law, right financing and the right design. And by that, he meant that in the current scheme, we, in the best of the cases, have public-private partnerships. So two sources of, of financing. People that are living in slums, is, they do have an enormous amount of resources. They just don't want to spend them in a piece of land where, from where they can be evicted. So they put it somewhere else. Uh, the moment you guarantee the rule of law, all that money goes into the construction of the city. And with the right design, and here comes the, the notion of the architect as a strategy or framing properly where all those big forces are going to be channeled instead of being repressed or, or um, yeah, re replaced by, by the formal uh, building market. So over here, I, I, there is this kind of conventional sequence let's say, even if you do it well, because this is already something that wants to bring formal, uh, a formal process into informality that doesn't happen, happen in, in slums. So the first thing is uh, define the rule of law. And it was an interesting uh, experiment in Chile in the 70s that was called Operation Choc. Actually, the only cost of the first uh, movement was just to draw with chalk on the land, uh, the property of the different families. If that costs almost nothing, just, just design, in, that's pure design. 
uh, and, and define what's, what's public, what's private. And that, the moment it's defined, it's very hard to be changed or defined individually. So it belongs to the half that families can not, not do on their own. In any case, rule of law, first thing, the conventional sequence would be you bring in sanitation. It may take a while. Um, then you build the sanitary booths. And then you have around that booth the same informal settlement. The, and, and those property tends to worth nothing. I mean, the, the quality of the neighborhood is close to zero. And that's not part of the things you would like to do when transferring money from the state to a family. So our approach was, OK, let's start from the same point, the rule of law, the chalk on the ground, just pure form. But then move the sanitary booth from step three to step two. The only difference is that the sanitary booth is at the front of the lot and in two stories. Actually, somebody said at the very beginning of the uh, elemental process, well, well, what you're doing is exactly the same thing that was done in, this, in the 60s and 70s. Uh, it's only in two floors and at the front of the lot. Exactly, oh, that's sorry. the whole difference. It's not rocket science. I mean, the moment you have two stories, then you're building the structure for yourself and your neighbor for that growth. But also you're guaranteeing some part of the urban front. So number two, sanitary booth with some specific design conditions. Only then you bring sanitation. And this is, this is important. This is a question of time more than space. You need to, as soon as possible, take families out of informality and bring it into this scheme. If you wait too long, then settlements begin to grow at a, at a rate that is just not sustainable. So by placing sanitation in step three instead of two, and this is how our, uh, our world has changed. Now we do have technology that was not there in the 60s and the 70s for, let, let's call it, cellular urbanism or cellular sanitation of the grid. I was looking at, at Bill Gates' uh, documentary in, in Netflix, and his, uh, the first chapter and uh, the first season is about the, the uh, uh, WC, you know, the, the water clothes. Uh, because nothing has been invented between the, the greed system, they're very expensive and, and rather low, and uh, digging a hole on the ground with all the consequences. In between, there's nothing. So I guess we do have technology today for cellular sanitation and cellular urbanism. And if that happens, then number four, by framing that and providing the structure so that families can channel their own interventions, then uh, that, that capacity is part of the solution, not part of the problem. Finally, Alejandro, um, if you had to pull back and describe your vision of the city of the future, how would you describe it? Ooh. <clears throat> what are the trends, perhaps, that we're seeing now that will inform that city of the future? I, I, would, I would say we, we do have nowadays two, two requests for answering that question. That is the more general one, another one influenced by the pandemic. I guess that that's a question that's floating in the air pretty much everywhere. Regarding the first, giving cities are not an accumulation of houses, but a concentration of opportunities that are extremely relevant and crucial, particularly for poor families. That's why they come to cities. People come to cities looking for opportunities. It's not that they're uh, wanting to live in bad conditions, but I guess that the, the cost of living in, in slums it's uh, lower than the benefit of having the chance to access a better life of, of jobs, education, healthcare, and so on and so forth. Uh, so if cities are concentration of opportunities, and it's particularly crucial for, for poor families, then cities should be measured by what you can do in them for free. The way to uh, look at the city of the future would be at those um, elements and components that are there as public good. In other ways, I would say that in the city for the future, uh, what's more important is what we're not going to build. The open spaces, the public spaces, the width of the street. Uh, 
even and, and this connects to to the pandemic and it has proved that open spaces uh being being able to be outdoor uh has become more and more uh an an antidote uh because we we, we may have some vaccines now they're beginning to fade there may be another virus so still the house will be the only vaccine as it was at the beginning uh we had these two recommendations you know wash your hands stay at home but what if you can't wash your hands and and can't stay at home because there's no home uh so i guess that there will be important an important uh request and challenge to provide that but the spaces in between those are crucial for a peaceful coexistence. The quality of the public will, uh, in a way, be crucial uh, for guaranteeing some quality in this friction that is created by living together. Um, and regarding the pandemic, yeah, we will still have to uh, take measures, but I guess that our gregarious nature, uh, we still, uh, and this is a, an Indian gen gentleman and then in a lecture once said to me, we may be using 21st century softwares, but our hardware is prehistoric. Our bodies haven't changed. Emotions still move us or, or, or prevent us to move. And, and that prehistoric way of, of experiencing life uh, will require to build this place to the places where we, we need. That, that's more or less uh, where I, I, I kind of intuitively think we, we will have to move. I think it's a great note to end on, Alejandro. Thank you so much. Really I'm appreciate so it. Thank you Thank so much. Bye-bye.